This is our first event of the spring semester. I'm Bridget Mullins. I'm the director of the program. And I just want to ask you before we begin, I don't know if cell phones work in here, but in case they do, um, let's turn them off. And thank you for that. And I want to thank our um, esteemed panelists. Um, they include Christopher Morrison, Yvonne Park, Elizabeth Passarelli, Noah Poles, and our moderator this evening is Prince Gomogilis. And um, there are bio, there's a bio sheet. Did everyone get one? It's available over there, so you can read about their experiences. <coughs> and um, uh, we're so pleased that they could join us this evening. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the first uh, event of the Master Professional Writing Program. We're a multi-genre, two-year, creative and pragmatic writing program. Um, we're multi-genre in that we're one of the only programs in the country that offers classes in um, writing for stage and screen, which is playwriting, television writing, and um, screenwriting. We also have fiction, nonfiction, um, and poetry. So it's a pretty broad church. We have a, a, a wonderful and amazing faculty. Um, including Prince Gomovilis. And um, in the back, sitting near the window, is Diana Lenny. She's on the window? Yes, on the windowsill. Um, looking dangerously, is Diana Lenny. And um, our other faculty include Sandra Singlow and um, Dana Goodyear and Janet Fitch and Sid Field and Coleman Huff, um, Amy Gersler. Just a, 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 very proud of our faculty. We have a, um, a flyer back there, a brochure. And if you're interested in the program, um, feel free to talk to me afterwards or to Dinah or to Prince or to find us on the internet. Um, also back there uh, on the table, there was a, uh, an event calendar. So um, you'll see that we have some other events coming up. And in fact, next week we have a reading and conversation with D.A. Powell. Um, these are two of Doug's books. He was just nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award for poetry. He's one of the most riveting readers of poetry that you'll ever hear. It's next week at this time in this room. Um, he also started one of the first electronic poetry magazines in the country. Um, he lives in the Bay Area. Um, we were colleagues at Harvard. We were both teaching there for a while. He's, he's an absolutely brilliant poet, and um, I would really encourage you, um, especially if you're interested in screenwriting, um, to come and hear him. The quality of his images is sublime. Um, so that's, that's our poetry event for next week. Um, and then we have all sorts of events for the rest of the semester. Um, I also want to point out, how many of you are... are um, uh, MPW students, let me see a show of hands. Okay, so guys, just so you know, the deadline for the writing and writing for stage and screening competition, the one act festival, which can be a, a short teleplay, screenplay, or stage play, the deadline for entries is next Thursday, February 4th at 5 p.m. No exceptions, and you bring those to Ebony, right, Eb? And you need hard copies, three? Okay. So, so, you have the weekend. <laughs> it's short. You can do it. Enter. What if you have nothing to lose? You just, just, just write something. Um, uh, so, so the structure of, of, of tonight's event is that Prince, who has assembled this, this, um, this lineup here, is, is going to um, moderate a discussion and, and jumpstart a discussion and conversation among the panelists. And then that will go for about 45 minutes and then we'll have a time for Q&A. And then afterwards we have a reception with these um, treats from um, City Kitchen. And I just want to say a couple of words about Prince. Um, Prince is a, a, a playwright and a screenwriter and um, his plays include uh, some of the most remarkable and funny evenings I've spent in the theater have been seeing Prince's plays. Um, and you can tell from the titles, Big Hunk of Burn and Love, The Theory of Everything, um, and the stage adaptation of Scott Hines' novel, Mysterious Skin. He's a recipient of the Penn Center USA Literary Award for Drama. 
and he also received one of those elusive and prestigious Chesterfield Writers Film Project Awards, um, which was sponsored by Paramount. He teaches here at USC. He also teaches uh, workshops at East West Players, and he writes a, a hilarious blog called Bamboo Nation, and um, we're, we're so thrilled to have him on our faculty here at USC, and I'm going to turn the evening over to Chris. Great. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Hello. Are you in good spirits tonight? Yes. 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 We're in your uh, State of the Union, but uh, thank you for being here. Um, uh, we have far more pressing issues here. Um, uh, so, yes, uh, as, as you know, we've got uh, Christopher Morrison here, G1 Park, Elizabeth Passarelli, and Noah Cole. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, when we were putting together this panel, we were kind of thinking about what uh, uh, people who are screenwriters or interested in screenwriting uh, might benefit from and, and, and be interested in. And uh, uh, we're thinking about how, um, if you're a screenwriter, um, unless you're like golf buddies with you know, the president of, of 20th Century Fox, um, there's a certain process that your screenplay is going to go through in order to um, uh, uh, get from uh, being read to possible sales, to possible development, to possible production, whatever. Um, and usually at the beginning of that process are, are people known as script readers. And script readers are uh, the people in development departments at studios and production companies who are considered to be the gatekeepers of the industry. They are the first people um, who are going to read your scripts uh, when they're submitted. Um, and, and many times they're the last word uh, uh, of whether or not your script will actually move on to the next level. So um, the panelists that we have tonight uh, all come from uh, various companies that have different backgrounds. So um, I was very careful in choosing um, people who had uh, experience with, with companies that are very different and do very different things and are very interested in, in different things. Um, and uh, as with all things, uh, context is, is very important, so I think, uh, I think it, it's kind of important to learn a little bit about uh, the companies that, that our panelists are affiliated with so you can kind of get an idea of where they're coming from. So I think just briefly, uh, why don't we just start with, with Christopher. Um, you, you lead for uh, a company called GMI, and uh, uh, it's my understanding that GMI is quote unquote a film finance company. Film finance company. And uh, when you told me this, I, I you know, I, I I think that I know a lot about film, but when you said film finance company, I have no idea what you've done. So why don't you tell me what GMI does, what it is? Sure. Uh, GMI is really um, one dude um, whose name is Gary Otto Lorenzo, and he is sort of the exception that proves the rule in Hollywood. Everybody has sort of this thought that there are these people running around Hollywood who've got all this money from a previous life, and they just pick projects, and they make they put money in, and projects happen, and they're happy, and they make lots of money, and they make more projects happen, and and they are accountable to nobody except for themselves because they have all this money. That person doesn't really exist except for the guy I work for. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, GMI Film Finance is really the brainchild of this uh, energized bunny of a man, um, Mr. Lorenzo, uh, who actually made his fortune originally in the music business. Um, he's a Grammy Award winning. Producer and worked with Quincy Jones, blah blah blah, name drop, name drop, name drop. Um, and uh, eventually got interested in film. Um, to the, uh, but he was smart enough to realize that he didn't know anything about it and didn't want to get swindled. So, being like I said, a man of boundless energy, he decided to go get a JD in entertainment law that he doesn't use, um, literally, just so that he knew what he was talking about. Um, he's one of these guys. Um, and from there, uh, became a bit of a hired gun as, a, as an associate producer um, and as somebody that could crunch numbers really, really fast and did a bunch of stuff for other people and then, of course, eventually decided that he wanted to do his own stuff um, and became involved in projects like Open Water and Death, the remake of Death Race that just happened. And, uh, regardless of how you feel about those films and uh, most, of them are, most of them are genre pictures, they, they're all screamingly successful. Um, so. He so gets, he gets is, he, is he like independently well? This, he doesn't finance all these things himself. He doesn't finance them all himself. By the way, he's smart enough not to do that. Um, but he is he's a he's a bit of a gatekeeper himself. He's connected up the wazoo. Um, another myth that doesn't really happen except for the guy I work for. Um, so he brings projects together. He can do finishing funds. Sometimes he comes in very late um, and uh, provides finishing funds. Sometimes he's the germ of a project. He finds a script 
and gets the ball rolling. Uh, sometimes he puts his own money into it, sometimes he doesn't. Uh, he will structure deals, he will talk to other people and throw deals at them so that he has nothing to do with it um, because he likes people, but he's also at least one of those mythical creatures in Hollywood who actually helps out people that he likes. Um, I'm, I'm curious, where, where, does, where does most of his money come from? Like, when he goes out to get money, or when he's like... I, I couldn't answer that question. Um, is it legal? Is it, it, uh, probably not. I mean, most of it's probably, you know, some shady deal that he had with uh, Michael Jackson. Are, are they domestic um, or international? Again, do you know if there's like domestic contacts, international hey, all, contacts? All of the above. Death, Death Race was financed primarily by German money, for example. Um, uh, open Water was all American stuff. Um, so it really depends. Um, right. He's all of the that. Uh, which, if you want to be, he's basically an independent producer. And if you want to be, if there's any of you that have an interest in that, wearing that hat, you, you're just going to juggle from day one and just keep juggling um, and keep going. It just makes it happen. Uh, Ji Wan, uh, you've worked for, uh, you're in the development department of uh, CJ Entertainment. Yes. Uh, it's my understanding that they began in Korea. Your, your company began in Korea, mm -hmm. uh, was there for many, many years, is now wheeling and dealing in the United States. So can you tell us a, a little bit about the, the sort of uh, gen uh, genesis of CJ and how yeah. how it's moved overseas now? Um, actually, CJ Corporation is like literally like the GM or Sony. So we started off as a sugar company, right? So as the yeah, the sugar, sweet sugar. <laughs> yeah. So the sugar uh, industry, as it grows bigger and bigger, it started off other subsidiary businesses. So right now we have uh, nine cable, actually nineteen cable networks, food, bakery, multiplexes, uh, entertainment, <coughs> shopping, internet malls, and etc. So uh, CJ Entertainment specializes in film entertainment. And in terms of U.S. business, we started off as a founding partner of Freemark Sets um, So Louder. we were, How was that? Louder, please. Oh, so we started, we started off as a founding partner of Freemark Sets And we distributed all Freemark and Freemark animation in Korea. And then now we've got sold Paramount. We are distributing all Paramount titles of Freemark and Freemark animation in Korea and some parts of Asia. So, in terms of U.S. business, we started off as um, distributor of U.S. films into Korea and Southeast Asia, and then now we are gearing more towards producing, development, and production side. So we are now in active mode to do uh, remakes of our movies, such as My Sexy Girl, or Lady Vengeance with Charlotte Theron, or <laughs> or <laughs> same yeah. thing, yeah, the second thing is the vengeance at Warner Brothers, who recently set up. Uh, or or some screenplay, something like uh, August Rush with Warner Brothers. Uh, or something like we can attach our internationally acclaimed Korean records, such as uh, Channel Park or Juno Bong with the Post. So we are trying to find some ways, various kinds of ways to get into the producing side of the US. And so how, how long have, have, have C, has CJ been, been doing um, business in the US? LA, in terms of production? Uh, it's been here for almost five years. And CJ Entertainment, the corporate office, has been around for 12 years. Great. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth uh, is, uh, is the development department. You're the one. That, you were running the whole show at Red Own Film, which is, is better known as Julia Robertson's company, correct? Yes. Um, so I guess the important question to ask here is, is Julia Roberts as statuesque in real life as she is? Um, you know, I actually need to say that I can't actually answer that, because I haven't had the opportunity to meet her Although I have spoken to her over the computer, <laughs> but um, so, so tell us a little bit about uh, the, they're not the company is not geared primarily towards just making movies for Julia. Roberts. No, actually, not at all. I mean, she doesn't really need any help <laughs> <laughs> making her getting getting movies, but um, it's it's more you know for her to develop other projects. Um, and in fact, one of the over the years, she's um, I think done a couple of the American Girl. Uh, movies just Kit Kittredge came out last year, I believe, and uh, and then she's been involved in some of the movies. She's been in like Mona Lisa Smile, um, but mainly my job is to look at other 
the scripts that would not necessarily be projects for her, but projects for her to produce. Um, it's a very small company, as <laughs> Prince said. It's uh, there's an East Coast um, executive producer and a West Coast executive producer, and then there's me, and, um, and that's it. <laughs> so everything, you know. Right. I mean, I I don't read every single thing that comes in because it's so small that the exact producer actually should read things too. Um, but I do, you know, read most of it. Great. We'll learn more in a, in a, in a little bit. Uh, so Noah, you you've actually been a script reader for a, a couple companies. Uh, you started out interning at Paramount Vantage, and then later on Bold Films, or is that the other piece? Bold yeah. Films, and then so tell us a little bit about Bold Films. Okay, Bolt Films uh, is a production company. Actually, who, did anybody see Legion this weekend? Mm -hmm. Maybe they go out yeah, they uh, they co-produced that. Um, they're basically funded by a Russian billionaire. And <laughs> when I was working there, the two considerations were it has to be commercial and it has to have a role for this guy's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, <laughs> but I actually uh, I when I moved out here after after college, you kind of have to start at the bottom being a, a, an unpaid intern, and that basically means you're reading a lot of scripts, doing a lot of coverage, um, and I spent four or five months at Bold, just kind of getting my feet wet, getting my foot in the door, and I read a lot of scripts prior to that, just um, as an aspiring writer, but. Uh, it was it was good to kind of see what was coming in and, and get a feel for uh, what they were looking for, which was mainly things that cost under thirty million dollars, um, action, comedy. Um, right, and then and then you eventually ended up at Paramount Vantage, a reading for them as well. Yeah, at the same time that I was interning at Bold, I was also interning at uh, Paramount Vantage, which was the fall of. Uh, 07, which was a really cool time because they had uh, Into the Wild, There Will Be Blood, Noah Baumbach's movie, um, and they were doing some really exciting stuff, so I wanted to be around that environment, and I actually got my foot in the door through interning in their marketing park. So I was, I was doing that for two days a week and bold for two days a week, all for no money, completely <coughs> surviving on the savings. Um, and on the last day of my marketing internship, which I realized I hated marketing, um, I walked over to the to the uh, development building and I said, "This is my last day in the marketing department as an intern, but I really want to read for you." Um, I was, you know, I've done coverage for this other company for a couple months now, and uh, I really like the kind of films you're making, and it happened to be that the guy. One of the readers was leaving, so I just, it was a combination of luck and just going over there and sticking my neck out and seeing what happened. And I got lucky. They kind of made me jump through a few groups to do, do some free coverage. Uh, their coverage was a little bit more uh, in depth than what Bold required me as an intern. We'll get into that a Yeah. Um, when you were at Paramount Vantage, were you like one of an army of, of readers? I mean, I, I imagine yeah. with a company that big that they're getting tons of scripts submissions. Yeah, I was one of uh, <coughs> maybe three or four readers, mm -hmm. and it was, it's, a, it's a funny job to have because you they send you the scripts to your home, so you're an independent contractor in a way. Um, so you're you can you know wake up at noon if you want and just you know set crazy hours, but as long as you get your coverage done, you get your scripts read on time, um, and you email it to the executives. How many, how many how many scripts were you expected to read like in a week or um, there or at Bold or roughly? I would read roughly. I mean, two scripts and well, after two scripts a day, they're kind of brain dead. I mean, beyond that, I was you know you can't really think straight. Um, so yeah, I would say at maximum probably you know ten. 10 to 15 scripts a week, but, you know, and I hear stories of assistants bringing home 50 scripts, and I'm just like, how do you do that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> you know. Elizabeth, do you, do you, does your company get a lot of submissions, or, um, do you, I mean, do you have stacks of scripts on your, on your desk? Um, I, you know, we go through sort of, I'm probably going to sound like a 
principles and values where it all get a lot, and, and we get a lot of um, manuscripts too, so we get a lot of unpublished um, novels, I see. and got to release novels, and, um, but no, I don't have that kind of volume where um, and I think that's because obviously, you know, Jay Roberts has an agent who filters out quite a bit of stuff as well, um, and, and because we're focusing on things that are not necessarily to star, you know, star vehicles for her. We're looking for different types. And we're definitely looking for you know, more independent, um, not the big budget action kind of you know, mm -hmm. things. We're looking for much more character Right. Is there a is there are, 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 is your company looking for specifically like female centric? Scripts like I mean, like with, with strong female protagonists, or I don't think that hurts, but I would say not necessarily. Um, I, I would say that really, from what I've seen, a lot of it is driven by what the exec producer is like. Mm -hmm. They're bringing stuff in, and then then they're filtering it, you know, and then they're they're taking it to her after it's been through the hole. She's not, you know, getting submissions. She's seeing things after they've gone through me. And, Exec producers or just exec producers, um, and then and then you know they've been we've really decided that this is something you know good enough to show. Right. Right. So. Uh, Chiwan, how how big is your department here in the your your development department um, here in the U.S.? We have four people in production slash de uh, development department, and then we have five or six. And, and everybody's reading scripts? Uh... Uh, interns usually do the everything. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then after the first filtering process, then we get to read uh, what seems to be interesting to us. Right, right. So I'm just curious, like, like can, can an intern who's, who's reading everything stop a script that didn't distract from getting on to, to being read by anybody else? Mm. Yes and no at the same time, but I think it's like case by case. Right. Right. But um, because we are a, a studio in Asia and we are acting as a semi studio slash production house in the States, so we get at least, I don't know, like 40, 50 scripts per week and 20 books per week. So we have to. Right, right. Okay. Christopher, uh, you're you're the guy. Right, so. Yeah. Over <laughs> so, so how does that work? He, he, um, best illustrated by Quick Story. Um, sure. I got hired on, and uh, I was in. I also happened to my theater cast raise your hands. Theater people in here. Nice. <laughs> Two of you. Okay. Oh well, I just want to impress anybody in here. Then I also direct theater. I was directing a show, and while trying to landscape with. <clears throat> carry on and he sent me over this script that I was supposed to just cover. It was the first thing I was supposed to cover for him for free, of course, after. Um, to make sure I had half a brain. Um, and he calls me in the middle of rehearsal, I tag out to take it because it's a job that pays. Um, and I take it and he's like, what do you think? I'm like, well, I, well, I sent you the written stuff. He's like, whatever, just tell me what you think. I'm like, well, it sucks. Um, basically, because i got to get back to rehearsal, i got to be succinct, right? So, well, it's terrible. He's like, really? Hold on, click. Uh, this is the dude that brought me the script. Uh, he's an actor that wants to be in the project. Tell him why it sucks. And I'm like, uh, here's why it sucks. Um, and I broke it down for him. Uh, the dude was clearly disappointed. And it turned out that he was going to turn around finishing funds that week. Um, the producers were pressuring him for finishing funds that week on this project. And because he caught me at a time where I was <coughs> honest, um, and as honest as I was possibly going to be, the project ended. Uh, for his involvement period. You destroyed and somebody's it, dream. I did. I did. On the phone with him there. It's amazing the sound of someone's dream breaking. Why? You can hear it <laughs> on the phone. Um, but yeah, so it can it can be that extreme sometimes. But um, yeah, that, just, that was the first, that was my first job for him. And he tended to like that. So, <laughs> so um, you all have read hundreds and hundreds of scripts, and, and you're reading scripts all the time on a, on a regular basis. I'm curious about how, what are some of sort of the, uh, before we kind of get into the specifics of your company and your company works for, um, I'm curious about s certain elements uh, among, across uh, good screenplays that sort of jump out at you personally. Like, what do you respond to personally um, when you're reading a script and you're like, wow, that's, that's, that's somebody who's got something right there. So, I, I don't know, Elizabeth, you want to start? Um, well, I really um, look for 
a well, really well developed character and dialogue. Uh, for, I don't know, but for me, dialogue, if you can't write dialogue, you, you probably should write scripts because it's important. And, uh, and, and a well developed character is the other thing because you can fix story points in a script, you can, you can fix a plot. But if you can't develop a character and you can't write dialogue, you're just maybe not going to be able to do this. So those are the, the two main things that I look for. If, I mean, if I see a concept that's just brilliant, but the writer is just, you know, just doesn't have the chops to, to develop it or, or isn't, just isn't a good writer, I will say, you know, my recommendation will be, you might want to consider this, but you might want to get another writer to develop this. Um, but most of the time, for me, it's, I'm going to look and see if you've got interesting characters who are going to keep me into that script. Mm -hmm. Because I know what my bosses are looking for, too. Like, right. They're not looking for the big action, you know, like, well, they blow things up. They, 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 don't, they, don't, they don't care about that. Right. Right. What, what do you respond to personally um, uh, in, in, in good scripts or great scripts? Personally, um, I don't know I like dark stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I like um, dark sci-fi or noir, um, but it has to have, like she said, compelling, very unique characters and universal things that can go across the world. And then... Right, because not only are you uh, looking for stuff to produce here in the U.S., it's got to have international appeal for your yes, company, Yes, right? that comes into both my interest and my company interest because uh, we are not only a public house, but we are also Asian studios, so we do a lot of international sales agent roles, so we have to take that in, uh, into consideration if it would work in other territories, right. such as Europe or Asia, and then we have to decide if we want to take a factor to distribute for sale. Right, so does, does that naturally push your eye to more genre material, like action, sci-fi, that um, kind of stuff? Yes or no, because in terms of genre, I mean, um, big movies like Avatar, that goes like a border. So we are always interested in big stuff, but when it comes to genre, there are certain genres that work and that does work. So something like um, uh, thrillers or horror that really work well internationally, but uh, like a quirky or broad comedy really doesn't work. So I was actually surprised to hear that uh, my friends in Korea and Japan don't know who Seth Rogen is. <laughs> because, yeah, Fan Effects for us didn't work at all in Asia because they don't get that comedy. Mm. So um, it's, yeah, so I personally like the genre, but I stay away from that, from the future. And also I personally just go to this kind of story that kind of connects different cultures around the world. Uh, something like a great AZ Paris or maybe back to the mm -hmm. uh, Noah, sort of, sort of the same thing, character? Uh... Yeah, character suit. Um, I respond, personally I respond to moments uh, that, like very human moments that you can recognize yourself in, you know, when you're reading something and it's not just derivative or something you've seen in another movie, but something that's uh, come out, comes out of your own life. Um, I think that's the great stuff. I also uh, I also really like uh, high concept stuff that's well executed. You know, you can have a huge action movie or a big comedy um, and it's done well with a good character and you know, well written and it's, it's likely going to get the great for us. So, yeah. So when you're working for a, a company like Paramount Vantage and, or, or Bull, I mean, are you are you pretty conservative in terms of like what you will um, give a recommend to uh, uh, yeah. on these scripts? Very much so. Yeah, um, I think it's because you know you don't you don't want to if you if you recommend a lot of stuff. I mean. Well, you have to be cognizant of exactly what the company's looking for. But, um, yeah, I mean, the executives are reading all this coverage, and they have to make a $30 million decision on something. You know, they have to decide whether they're going to put a ton of money in, into the story. So there's a lot at stake. So, you, so that's something that keeps you from recommending something that's 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you told me that like at all your time at Paramount, uh, you only recommended one script out of like, yeah. the tons. How many did you read over there? Like hundreds. Yeah, yeah. The one script that I gave a recommend to uh, was The Wrestler, which uh, <laughs> was just uh, an extremely well written script. Uh, Robert Siegel has a terrific voice as a writer. It just immediately, within one page of reading it, I was like, oh my god, it was so refreshing to actually forget that I was reading the script. And, uh, you know, there were, there were scripts that, that were good. A lot of them were, were uh, constructed, you know, they, the writer had technique, they knew what they were doing, but they just didn't have that extra something which the rest of them had. So, yeah. Chris, what about you? What, what, what do you respond to personally? Uh, efficiency is the biggest thing for me. Uh, coming from the play, the theater world, um, where, uh, and I mean this in the best possible manner, where in writing adult is a bit more indulgent, um, and I, I mean that in the best possible manner. I really do. Um, screenwriting is the so the complete dark mirror opposite of that. Um, a, a screenwriter doesn't know how to be efficient with their language, uh, whether it's in their action or in their dialogue, um, is going to really sinks it for me right away. Um, and it's sort of the old cliche, you see these giant chunks of text in a screenplay, and red flags just go up for me immediately, because they just don't understand that they're writing for, they're reading, they're writing for a reader. Um, if, I, if I've got my hands on it it's, it, it, it's bad news. They can't get it to an executive producer. They can't get it to someone else. They don't understand the, they, it's, a, it's a big signal that they don't even understand the process that they're going through. Um, because, as Noah pointed out, you may have on your desk at any point in time ten scripts that you go through, and you'll get cross-eyed by the time you're halfway through one bad one. Um, it'll ruin your day. Uh, it'll ruin your week. Wait, when, uh, you, when you hit yeah. a really when you hit a really bad one, do you you don't read the whole thing, do you? I I, I have to. I, again, I'm I'm not in Noah's situation where I'm getting like ninety thousand scripts curried over to me. I'm, I'm at this dude's whim. So if he's busy, one I might not hear from him for like two weeks, and then all of a sudden he's got like eight scripts he wants me to read. So. Uh, I, I read everything cover to cover. I also feel like I'm just I'm just too nice so far. I probably will lose that very soon. Um, I just get to the point where you just start skimming. Uh, John August has a great description that says like if you can't introduce a character, he stops reading your script. Right from your character introduction, like right there. Um, and I'm starting to believe him <laughs> a lot. Um, but anyway, uh, so efficiency is just really being efficient and being crisp. And can I see it in my head? Can I see it in my head when I'm reading a, a it's a visual medium, and you just and it's hard. It's a hard lesson, especially for me to learn coming from the theater world. It's a visual medium. If I can't picture what's going on in my head as I read it, and I've got to go the extra mile to see something, where I'm in trouble. And when it, and it is, it's it, you can't. I can't explain. After you've read like eight things that are terrible, the one that comes across your desk that is beautiful and well done, and well constructed, and efficient, and has a voice. I'm, my, your shoulders just go, ah. it's, it's amazing, it's, it's a whole different experience. So just jumping off this, uh, this, this kind of talk about lack of efficiency in yeah. screenplays, are there, are there common traits among, among bad screenplays, like do you see like common mistakes, like it's like, yeah. oh, they're doing that again, yeah. does yeah. everybody do that? Yeah, um, and it's, it's sick to say, I just read a script that had 17 typos on the first page. <laughs> exactly, and you're just like, what? How do you call your, how do you get up in the morning and call yourself a writer? You don't know what a comma is? I mean, come on. Um, and not that I'm a grammar queen or anything like that, but, um, uh, wow, I'm becoming one. Um, it's just, again, it's just another red flag that someone doesn't have a love of their craft, doesn't have, isn't invested, hasn't spent the time to think, oh, maybe I should read it before I send it out. <laughs> or give it to somebody who is a grammar queen to, like, knock it into shape. So typos will do it to you right away. Uh, bad fish is bad. Um, uh, bad, uh, I don't know how it happens, but at the highest level is bad format. <coughs> Things that are formatted wrong. I have no idea how it happens, but it happens all the time. And my big pet peeve is, is the misuse of the Riley, um, which is the parenthetical underneath the character name that supposedly is the writer talking to the actor to tell them how to perform the line, which is also a bit of a no-no anyway. So, But then when somebody sticks in like a four-sentence Riley about <laughs> their left eyebrow raises and they, you know, look shooting daggers or whatever. Um, and that Riley should just be, if you have to use it, it's one word, usually ends in L-Y, um, and please get rid of it and be done with it. Um, 
So anybody sticking action in O'Reilly, again, it's just somebody doesn't want to crack with what they're doing. Elizabeth, what about you? Common, common sort of mistakes among bad screenplays. Uh, well, what Christopher said is definitely true. I'm, I'm, you know, an English major, so it drives me crazy. I want to throw the elements of style at them or something. By your desk. But the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that you know, screenwriting is 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 there's a definite format to it, and one of the you know the most important things is show don't tell. And people who sit there and say, and he was thinking this, and, that, and they, they start writing all this stuff that's right. interior, right. that if you can't see what's being written on the screen, you shouldn't be writing it, because it's not a script. And, and the people who give, you know, camera directions, or sort of saying which song is playing, <laughs> or details, and necessary details of what everyone is wearing, and like they have to list every designer right down to their shoes, their designer handbag. It's like, if it's not integral to the plot, we don't need to know it, and we, you shouldn't be telling us it. G1, what about you? I totally agree with her, because if you don't write a script like that, you should be just writing a novel. Right. Yeah, write a book. Because there should be difference between novel and the script, and then you should make some room for the film writers creativity, mm -hmm. their own thinking. So I am very um, trying to stay away from the kind of way to be told to the scripts. And also another thing is that I think it's, it's just a general problem, but um, a lot of young writers are writing a lot of things that are already out there, like subject matters. So for example, when Chino came out, everybody started writing about this smart talking teenager. When <laughs> 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 Twilight is doing good, everybody started to, uh, writing about vampire love. So I think I think um, it, it sounds very general, but you cry. You might want to stay away from writing overexposed subject matter. Right. That was actually my, my next question. I was I was curious about. I know, like in the theater in the theater world, that that play there, there seems to be like this collective consciousness among playwrights. And they all start writing about the same th same thing about at about the same time. So I'm wondering, is that is that true with all the scripts that, that, that come in? Like like it's like, oh my God, it's another talking porcupine script. What, what is going on? Is that is that true? Yeah, I got you written my talking porcupine script. <laughs> Elizabeth, um, I haven't seen a lot of. I don't get a lot of stuff that's really specifically genre. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't get it. I, I haven't been getting. I did get one pregnant teenager, <laughs> <laughs> but it was. Um, but no, not not so not so much true for me. Although occasionally, you know, the odd horror flick or something will come across, right. and then of course, I mean, the horror films or slasher films. I guess I should really say are. They're always the same. <laughs> if there's ever one that's different, you're like, wow. Because you just know right away, you know, mm -hmm. what it's going to be about. No, certain certain kind of scripts that you're, you're kind of sick of seeing, because there are a lot of them out there? Um, no, I've seen, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of scripts deal with similar relationships, you know, it's like, you know, you know, there are only so many stories to tell, but if you can put your own twist on it, I'm, I'm, I'm much more forgiving of it. But sometimes it'll be scripts where, like, you'll see a character, and it's like they have the same, you know, background in, in multiple scripts. It's like they really like, I don't know, car racing or something. It's like, I just read that. I love the We didn't get into your, uh, your screenplay pet peeves. Oh, yeah. Do you have any? Oh yeah, I wanted to add to that. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see in scripts <coughs> for beginners is that the, the main character doesn't want something bad. They're just kind of meandering around and they don't have something that they're struggling that you're rooting for um, and they're having trouble getting it. Like, you know, if you're having three guys sitting around talking about their day, it can be really boring. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I would I would say uh, make us root for that character, and if you put if you put somebody that you like and that you feel for in jeopardy, and you, you know, make them want something bad enough, we'll immediately root for them. And if they're not likable, they at least have to be interesting as a character. So I'll say that, yeah. when when you all are reading screenplays, um, I know that that 
that reading a good screen, a good screenplay is, is, is not necessarily enough to sort of move it on to the next level because you, you work for specific companies that have specific interests and are looking for specific things. So I'm wondering uh, 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 the types of things that inform the way that you read um, uh, that are influenced by, by the company that you work for. Um, so, uh, Christopher, I mean, are there... Are I'm, there... I'm utterly at the whim of whatever his whims are, basically. Um, so, but, not to get into sort of advice land here, but some of you, I assume, are eventually going to get this gig, and the first question that should be out of your mouth is, what do you want? Um, and that, that question literally got me a job, basically. That, and I knew who Saturday Night Live was. Um, but, um, you, you have to read for whatever the company's looking for, whatever the company's doing. Um, I have a bit more of an extra gatekeeper because things tend to filter through. Gary, I don't want to get to me anyway. So he tends to be slight, unless he's doing somebody a favor. Um, it's already gone through one filter. But even from that, I had to learn how he wanted me to talk to him. I had to learn um, exactly what kind of coverage he had, what his coverage he wanted to look like. I have, we have a ridiculously extensive eight-page coverage that I have to do. Um, and so it's going to be whatever he is sort of looking for at the time. Um, and that's been everything from like hardcore character driven pieces to I, he's ready to make another $20 million. So it's got to be, it's got to have a certain budget. It's got to have a certain, it's got to be a genre piece. And it's got to be a certain, have a certain angle to it. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm making bad answers. <laughs> I'm not this question well. Um, I read whatever he wants. I look for whatever he wants at the time. Um, so, right. yeah. Elizabeth, are there are there some parameters that you work within given given your company? Well, it took me kind of a while to figure out what they were because of course they say, oh, we, we want everything, you know, we want to, but you know, really that's not true. Um, really, what I have seen go forward and be popular are, and and this surprises me, but drama. They like drama, and they also like sort of the you know, little Miss Sunshine kind of quirky comedy. Um, that sort of thing, and those are the two things that I have um, really, and, and a lot of them have been, um, you know, American, you know, stories, stories of American families, stories of, of and, and most of them have been contemporary. They, they're sort of resistant to, to period stuff, um, although not all of it, but, um, but I've just found that, you know, through sort of trial and error, because I'll find something, and I'll, and I, you know, I bring that stuff too. I find things, and I will bring out something. Look, it's so great, and I'll be like. Victorian, it's a divorce, you know, that's a terrible <laughs> idea. It's a divorce. This is first of all, so interesting. You know, and so it's really, um, uh, I, I've just sort of like the try and error discovered that their real focus seems to be well, not that kind of independent kind of stuff. Well, you know, uh, different parameters at Paramount Vantage from Bold? I mean, well, Bold and, Bold and Paramount Vantage actually had a similar budget range. Um, which was? Which was about. Five million to maybe thirty-five million. They didn't really want to go more than that, um, and they were open to all kinds of genres. Bold was a little more genre-driven, more more horror, action, comedy. Um, but Paramount Vantage was willing to look at period pieces. Um, they had that movie The Duchess, which came out with Kira Knightley, which didn't do very well. But um, but uh, yeah, I would say primarily budget. Consideration. Yeah, I should catch out of that budget's always concerned, especially for us. Um, so he usually is thinking a certain kind of budget range. Um, so that's always, as a writer, that's one of his primary concerns. If there's a set piece in there that seems ludicrous, that involves you know eight tall ships and a cannon battle, um, you know or whatever, it's, it's gone. The script is gone. Um, I want to talk about. Oh, go ahead. I just want to add. It's, it's not that you can't write the period piece if, if you want to. It's that just know ahead of time that you have a strike against you. You know, I mean, just be prepared that that's that, that the market is looking for certain things. Um, but you know, you but there write it. but there's certain side types of genres that never go out of the style that are always trendy that you're always. <laughs> 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 um, comedies. Yeah. People want to laugh. Yeah. I mean, the horror genre seems to be an endless well of hack and slash. Um, and I don't, don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of the hack and slash. Um, 
but it, it's, it, it works, as they call it, you know, the phrase is evergreen, it's evergreen, particularly on video store shelves, you know, mm -hmm. as that, obviously video store shelves are going to go away, so we'll see how that evergreen <laughs> quality lasts, but definitely. I want to talk about writing coverage a little bit. Um, uh, Christopher, isn't that unusual? An eight-page It's really unusual. It's really much <laughs> It's just like, what are you doing? What, what is it saying? What is he asking for? What is he asking for? Here, I'll, I will. I brought some just because it's so unusual. Just so you can see this. Um, and after you can come up, these are. This is every point that he wants checked off um, as good, bad, or indifferent. So, so read out some of those points. Um, well, he's. I also have to understand he's coming from a very strong Robert McKee background, um, and you can order amongst yourselves on what, what you think about that. So I was not totally familiar, so I had to. The first thing I had to do was buy this thinking book and read it. Um, so you hear some stuff that you'll recognize, but the stuff to begin with is for anybody. Story, story, structure, dialogue, writing, commerciality. Visual elements, title, characters, here's where we get into the McKee language, plot, that's not in the McKee language. Character orchestration is inciting incident, inciting incident setup, arising conflict, crisis, climax, yes, they're two different things in his system, resolution, unity, opposite, unity, unity of opposites, subplot, jumping, exposition scenes, <laughs> plot switch, blah, blah, blah. Um, that was like a performance art piece. Thank you. Thank you. I wore my blacks today, I'll dance later. <laughs> Do you want, what, what's your coverage like? Is it, is it, is it that complicated? Or? No, not at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, to some degree it gets complicated. Oh, if we really like it, we want to break down the character to the plot to some degree. And also, I mean, we do a lot of an analysis creatively on the story itself, but also we add uh, a lot of market data research mm -hmm. too. So, so we add something like, uh, we want to see uh, last five years of films that might have seen this like that, and then how it's played around the world, and how it plays in Asia especially. Um, wow, so you're already doing market analysis in the coverage. <laughs> yes, we require our guys to do it. Yeah. Oh. To, yes. How does that not reach eight pages? <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Elizabeth? Uh, what's, what's, what's going on with the coverage of her? Uh, I uh, feel uh, very fortunate <laughs> <laughs> in a lot of mean way. And uh, my coverage tends to be like four pages. And, um, and I, because I work with so few people and because there's not you know, a lot of analysis or anything going on, it just really that reaction. So I not only have the luxury of, of um, putting in some of my own you know, really when you do coverage, you are, you are not supposed to put your own thoughts or feelings about it, and you're supposed to be as neutral as possible and just stick to the point of whether this works or this. But it's very, very difficult because, uh, you know, how can you say, how can you subjectively, you know, or, or objectively say something is bad because everybody is subjective. So, but luckily they sort of appreciate my sense of humor and they don't mind if I um, <laughs> put a little bit of my own, you know, and I, I like to sort of spice things up with them sometimes, so I'll, I'll make it fun again. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they seem to appreciate that. So, but yeah. I, I'm getting much, it sounds like a lot more leeway than, than you guys. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I definitely have a comment section that is just all my comments on the scripts, which is usually half a page um, as well. And he also wants reader recommendations for the fixes. So um, I'm a little bit a little bit more than a reader, maybe a little story consultant type of stuff that's going on. If, it, if he... Particularly if he feels like, if I'm going to recommend or at least even think about have, passing on, letting him read the coverage even, um, then he needs fixes and he, he we even instituted a pros and a cons page and all sorts of stuff. So, but that's for production as well as for um, the script itself. Yeah, I had a question about that. Um, yeah. um, uh, so, you know, if, if you come across a script that's, that's good but not great, oh, yeah. Um, is it possible that that good script might move on to be developed, or, or do you just we try have, it out right there? I mean, our, usually most coverages is recommend, consider, and pass. That's usually what most people have. We, of course, have more. <laughs> we have recommend, strongly consider, consider, consider with reservation, and pass. Um, so, um, I, I, I have the same, same thing. I've literally recommended two scripts, and I've strongly considered maybe two others. Um, so I and then I feel like I have to really back that up in terms of like what I feel. If the, and then of course the writer gets 
the same breakdown, recommend, strongly consider, consider, whatever. Um, so my fixes have to be pretty solid. I have to know my own stuff so that I can really, when I'm, because I know eventually he's putting me on the phone with somebody again, um, yet again, that I have to back my stuff up. So my, my, my coverage tends to be more solid that way, and I get a chance to really say what I think uh, about things. I might have a few more questions, but let's uh, let's start opening it up uh, to the audience. Uh, does anybody have a, a question for our panelists that you're just dying to ask? Yeah. Well, actually, um, along the same lines of what you were just talking about, you mentioned that uh, you might not even have something that's going to be the same thing that you have to pass the coverage along at all. Although I always pass the coverage along, I just he, with his with the, again, I have a special relationship. Um, uh, he's not. I pretty much write the company eight page coverage, and then I I call him and talk to him about it anyway. Okay. So. During the phone conversation, and because he, he literally not only runs a film company, he's got a tech company and a music business going at the same time, he'll literally be like, what am I doing? I'm like, you're not reading it, don't worry about it. You know, put it, we have, we have a, a code, and it's called the shredder. Um, and it's, uh, it's, I've gotten the point. Sometimes. The, not really. I mean, really, the coverage is the coverage, but if he's going to read the coverage, I have to tell him to read it, basically. If, 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 if a screenwriter were to read his or her own coverage, would he or commit she suicide? Like horrified? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hard, right? It can be. I mean, because, look, your job is to say no as a reader. All right? My job as a gatekeeper to this guy who's got more money than I can imagine is to make sure he doesn't lose that money, right? And that's a ludicrous responsibility, especially coming from theater where we're like, we have no money! We have a plastic bottle and five dollars, make a show, you know? Uh, so the other end of the spectrum that I'm coming from, I'm very protective of his money. It's uh, absurd, but it's true. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, as Noah said, I, mean, I think every reader feels pressure to be like, your name's on this thing. It better be freaking good. You didn't write it, but if you're gonna pass it on to somebody who's gonna consider dropping a bill on it, you better have, you better really believe in it. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, have you had any instances where you passed on a project that has gone on to you know, <laughs> critical opinion and you got to you got to flat for the time that you passed on and you can share? Not yet. <laughs> I'm sure it's coming. Like, can you share how you handled that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anywhere? Cool. I have a movie that we passed, but it's great that we can really do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have the three biggest career movies that I reject to our career domestic production team to turn down. Um, one is Old Boy. We did the Mr. Vengeance and we did Live Day Vengeance. And then The Chaser. But now you can make the remake of the old boy. That's right. Yeah, so we don't own the remake rights. Uh, so oh. yeah. But we only uh, do Lady Vengeance and Mr. Vengeance. Okay. The Chaser, the Chaser is set up at Warner Brothers with the reunited departed team. Either of you want to address that? I remember passing them was what happens in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really know that. Actually, I didn't really know that. Made a lot of money though, so yeah, right after this. Yeah, I was curious for those of you about like how it's affected how you written scripts and if you like pass on your own scripts to see like obviously like the next thing so it's just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, several, several of the panelists actually have writing background, so how does that inform what you do? Um, it's good. It's a good, I, I think, I think uh, reading scripts is a really good thing. I think being a reader for a company uh, will destroy your soul <laughs> if you do it for too long. Yeah. And it will, it will, for me personally, this is my, my opinion is that you're using your critical, the critical part of your brain when you're reading these scripts, and it becomes very hard to disengage and go into the creative part of your brain when this is what you're doing day in, day out. The last thing you really want to do after you've read and covered two scripts is look at another script to work on. Um, but I would say that, yes, definitely it's helpful to do it. Um, 
you, you learn what works, what doesn't work. Um, and now, now that I'm not uh, being paid as a reader anymore, I, I read scripts for fun. I still read a lot of scripts. I try to read a script every day. But now it's more enjoying it and looking at it. So, yeah. But that definitely has helped. Yeah. You, you, you uh, write screenplays and also fiction, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I actually, you know, I, I, I love the reading of the scripts. Not, I mean, I always have a different thing. But, but when, I, when I read a good script, it is just a thing of beauty, and I'm so excited, and I find it to be so helpful. And I wish I could read a good script every day, you know? But, um, but instead I read, you know, good script every, you know, 20 scripts or so, maybe. Um, but I, I do find it to be really helpful, and I think anybody who wants to write scripts should be reading as many scripts as they can. It's, it's you know, it's, it's research. It's, it's incredibly helpful, to, and to read the bad ones too, so you can see what doesn't work. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I find it really helpful. I, I would think I'll keep doing it until I stop paying. Okay. <laughs> Other end of the two. Um, it's amazing to me when I read a bad script and I tear it apart and then I open my script and start working and I'm like, same problem! Uh, it's, uh, so, it's really good that way for me. Uh, it's, it's, it's been such an eye-opener. And again, uh, to keep quoting my, un my mentor, really doesn't know he's my mentor, John Armis, is like, you know, you need to do it at least for like a year. You need to dedicate, even if you're not going to get paid for it. You just need to sit down and read everything you get your hands on, script-wise. Um, I also happen to believe that you just need to keep reading, regardless. You know, I, story, I was lucky, I figured out I was a storyteller when I was like four, so I started lying. Um, and then I started writing. So, um, I just, I, you have to constantly keep reading, regardless. You've got to keep story as part of your life. You have to become, that has to become second nature. So, it's great when you get a chance to read just stacks and stacks of other people's visions. At the same time, I've always had an audio book going in my car. I've got two or three books on my bed and I stand, and you know, it's just, it's always got to happen for me, always. By the way, John, John August has, has probably the best screenwriter in the world. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, if you got it, johnaugust.com. He wrote Go, he wrote Big Fish, he wrote the Charlie's Angels movies. Charlie's Angels, um, the first one. And, and he, he made The Nines also, oh, yeah. he has a screenwriting law where he, he kind of dispenses insider advice about, it's about great. writing. It's really, it's really terrific, so check it out if you don't know it. Um, other questions from you? Yeah, so let's go right back there. As far as like reading adaptations, do you, do you read a lot of adaptations, first of all? And second of all, if you do, is there something different that you're looking at? Do you go back and read the source material, or um, if you have read the source material, do you look for it to be true to the original, or to have a, a different vision in a way? You want to start with um, it? We had a project uh, called Birds and Fall, which which first came to us as a book, and then the director developed it into uh, the adaptation developed it into a script, and it was really interesting for me because it's the first time this has ever happened to me, the only time this has ever happened to me where I thought the script was actually almost better than the book. It really distilled everything and. I, and I, I had thought the book was okay, pretty good, really good subject, got a plane crash. Um, but when I read the script, I was so moved, and it was so interesting and to see how this director had taken this book, and, you know, was not the original writer, and, and really found the heart of it. And um, like I said, that doesn't happen very often, but it was a, it was a rare and wonderful experience. <laughs> No, you were going to say something about adaptations? Yeah, um, thinking back, I, I, I read a, a bunch of adaptations of graphic novels, which were kind of in for a little while and still are. Um, and also, a, a major trend is, is taking foreign films and adapting them for American screen, which is uh, I guess, well, happening a lot more now. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny because you, you, think, you think most of the stuff out there, they want it to be like a pre-existing property that kind of alleviates some of the risk factor. But thinking back, most of the scripts that, that I covered were, were not adaptations. They were, they were a lot of originals. Do you want, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that, that you're, you're going to love adaptations. Yeah, because um, we're doing a lot of remakes of our original titles. So we do a lot of adaptations. And mostly we would like to 
put a new skin on it because the original is already thinner, so we don't need anything replicate of it anymore. And also, we want we have this um, a respect for the original material and original records, and then we we just want to keep as it is, and then we want to kind of bring new element to it. So we recently uh, set up uh, we make projects at Warner Brothers on. Um, these are engines, simple things are engines, and I'm going to share with you guys in the chat. So first we want to do the engines trilogy of Channel Park. Uh, so this writer, uh, who is named Brian Hogger, who did it in the city. So Brian Hogger, who is a playwright in New York, and then he came up to us and then he pitched us really, really new skin on it that, that changed a lot of Korean specific environment to very East Coast American context, and then that totally changed the vibe of the movie, and then it really was attractive to the student buyers. So um, when it comes to the remake, we want to put more layers onto it, and also we started this development deal with Fortunate, which is Chris Campus's movie. So we are talking about this new thing in the public radio market, and then we are talking to this character mutually. So we are talking about it and then we are kind of going back and forth between true to the original or Mutually's more creative original vision. So we are kind of taking the basic form of the story and then and then reshape it into more modern and more trendy, more poppy version. Yeah. The that's how we want to Speaking of pitching, Elizabeth, you and I were talking last week about how um, how it's really important for, for writers to be able to talk about their work. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about, about pitching a little bit. Do you want to say a few words about that? Oh, um, no, what I was saying is, uh, I went to the film school here. And the one thing that that they never taught us was pitching. And they didn't even tell, tell us how to talk to an agent. Because talking to an agent is an art in and of itself. You have no idea what they're saying, but whatever they're saying, it means go away generally. <laughs> they're saying they love you, you're the best thing, they're going to be big, and it just means we'll never see you again. But you know, they don't they don't teach you any of that. And I really think there's would be it would be great if writers coming out of the gate got that because it's a terrible learning curve that you go on where um, you you're in love with being an artist and a writer, and, and, and it's an art, and you love your writing and then you suddenly are thrown into a business environment and the people that you're going up against are thinking business. They're thinking, how can I make money off this? They may be thinking, that's a beautiful script. It's so well written, I love it, but if I can't make money, there's no point in it for me. And it's it's just a heartbreaking process for a writer. So you have to be able to go in there and approach it like it's a business when you go into pitch. And you have to think of the things that they want to hear that's, that's going to make them give it the green light. Um, you know, how can I how can I sell this to you, not just on my writing, but on the idea that you can make some money off of this, you can sell this. <coughs> I find knowing how to nod your head a lot at all in notes that come, and so yes, yes, and then taking the ones that actually work um, is an important skill for writers to get a hold of. And it's, it's really tempting at the beginning to take every single note, because it's going to be perfect and that's exactly what it is. They won't remember. Four days later, the notes, the de super detailed note they gave you. So, you, you've got, I mean, there's a famous story of Kevin Smith that, like, he turned in the last, whatever, one of our scripts is to a wide scene, and the wide scene's like, it's terrible, take it away. And so he took it back, and he just took out ten pages and sent it back. And we're like, it's genius. You took all the notes, it's brilliant. So you've got to, I mean, he did do something, is the lesson to be learned there, is that he didn't just send the same script back. They're very good at detecting that. <laughs> Somehow that meter's on the on the radar. But um, so you've got to learn how to really taking notes is so so important. It's an art form in and of itself. Um, and being flexible with your own story, not falling completely in love with your own story, and realizing that film is a collaborative process. Again, I'm sort of lucky I came from theater where I, I got that all right away. So it seems like the film industry has got this sort of myth that there are directors and there are producers and there are writers and they all go away and they do stuff. You're button heads on the phone, in person, over email, fax, all the time. So it's a give and take. You've got to be able to take notes. I'd be a good note. We had a question up here. Yeah. Uh, 
Yes. Sir. Yes, I was wondering if you could offer some more specifics about what you look for in a character in a script. You say good character. Is there something else you think I have to Yes, what does good character mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, when you, when you meet somebody, when you're intrigued by them, what is it about them that intrigues you? You know, I mean, in real life. You know, it's usually they're either a shady character or they're doing something really extraordinary or, I don't know, you know, I mean, I think, uh, especially, with, especially with villains, you know, you want to kind of, you want to kind of explore the, the, the humanity of the villain as well. I think that's important too. But for me personally, I, I'm a fan of uh, kind of characters or traits, you know, fun character that will, will kind of go around and do, you, you want to follow them just because they do things so unexpectedly. Um, yeah, that's kind of... Anybody else? What does good character mean to you? Yeah, I think it's it's a lot of times it's it's people that you can relate to that you can see yourself in would be one thing. I mean, I one thing I really that always saddens me is when I'll get that script where it's set in high school and the cheerleader's a bitch and the mom is a, is a is a jerk and the nerdy little girl with the glasses is destined to be the hero and get the get a really cute guy to fall. So she takes her ponytail down. Yeah. <laughs> I get so tired of these stereotypes, even when they're done, you know, fairly well. They're still stereotypes, and I just want to see something different. I want to see, you know, that kid who maybe is the art student, but not the nerdy art student. Maybe they're popular. Maybe, you know, just show me a real person instead of relying on the cliches that everybody already knows. You know, and, and when you do see them, I like, like, no, I was saying, you know, you, you recognize them because they come off as, you know, wonderful people that you actually want to love and through 20, 120 pages or 90 pages. I mean, for me, my recommendation is you know, write your cliche-ridden script. Do it. Do it where you're writing and you're like, you know exactly what's going to come next as a writer. Like, you've got no choice but to write that one-liner and stick around or whatever it is, you know? It's there for you. So you get that out of your system because the problem with it as a reader is if we're a page ahead of you as a reader, we're done already. Um, so you as a writer have constantly got to ask yourself, am I, am, are you surprising yourself? Right? Is the next scene not coming because there's no choice that it has to come because it's, it's what's expected? It's the next scene is interesting and engaging and it's the next step in your character's journey. You know, because your character's doing something, please, you know, and because they want something and they're going after it. Um, and so it's informed, but it's not the cliche next step. If you know it right away, you know, it, you shouldn't sit in bed and dream up an entire trick from top to bottom, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, God bless you if you can do it, and it's original and nifty. But that's usually a red flag that you're writing a script that you've already seen somewhere, or a movie that you know already, or a character that you get. Problem is, the readers got that three times today already. If you can't surprise yourself, really look at your story, and really look at your characters, um, and ask yourself some really tough questions. Okay, over here. Yes. Um. I have a question for those of you who have like written yourself things. Um, I'm always told to like write what I know, and I feel like that's the easiest thing to write. <laughs> I don't know, but I was wondering what your take on that is. Yeah. So, um, it's good advice, but it's um, you don't necessarily have to write you specifically. I mean, you can you can write. I mean, yeah, you can you can write the autobiographical script um, if you want to do that and get it out. It's probably a good exercise to do that. But you can you can write the script about you know setting somebody on Mars, and you can still put your own feelings into something like that. So when people say write what you know, I don't think they're saying write exactly your life. Um, unless you're like Howard Hughes or something. <laughs> but, um, you know, but that's the, that's the cool thing about this. You can put yourself into characters who you aren't, and you can still be them. And, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I, I would totally agree. Write, writing from a personal place is the best stuff, always, always. Right, and, and writing what you know, uh, you know, is, I think is often misinterpreted because it's not it's not necessarily 
writing, uh, you know, a setting that you know and characters that you know. But what that means is writing from a very unique point of view. That's that's from you. Um, uh, and point of view doesn't necessarily mean that you know it's like writing about being a, a student at USC and, and you know whatever whatever it is that you are. It's, it's having it's having a point of view. It's having a voice uh, that's very unique to you. So that's that's what writing what you know really means. I want to add to yeah. that because um, I would write what you know is like write what you learn about your life. That's what you said. But uh, there's a move. There's a, there's a movie called Moody. Mm -hmm. Have you guys seen it? Check it out. Dr. Jones, yeah. Dr. Parker. Yeah. So, um, he doesn't know anything about like Mars and Moon, but what inspired him to do that movie is because he had a long distance relationship <coughs> at the time. And then he wanted to explain, he wanted to, he wanted to express the frustration, the longing, and sadness and loneliness through his movie through this type of movie. So I think that kind of fits into it. That's a great example. Yeah. My interpretation of that has always been um, write your relationships. And what that means doesn't mean Woody Allen, like, I'm in my own movie and I'm writing my relationship, but I don't think it happened right now. I mean, the relationships as you understand them in your life, the old cliche, personal is universal, is I, I just happened to have some success with that with my first short, and it, it was basically sort of my family, except I was cooler. Um, <laughs> um, and I, you know, and it's it was slightly supernatural in, in its take. But basic relationships, and it was basically my first script, were was my family. Um, but I wasn't writing my brother, and I wasn't writing my mother. The, the attitude and the relationships within the family were there, and it pumped up a little bit more. And then I layered in another layer of, of the supernatural element, just because I think reality is boring. Um, I live here, um, I, so I always tend to look for sort of reality plus type stories, anyway. So I think that's what it means. And to this day, it's, it's one of I think one of my one of my better works, just because people seem to relate to it in a real direct manner. So, but again, no conversation in my life was in that script. Right? That's not what it means. Just that's, that's the way I tap into that recommendation. You can look at your relationships and use those as fodder. I think we have time for a couple more questions, so let's uh, mute. So nice. Yeah, um, if you read a comedy script and, and you notice that the writers try to make the, like, the action descriptions funny and the whole script's kind of jokey, do you, does that turn you off or is that a good thing? Is it just better to avoid that and be efficient? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, funny, I, funny, you know, I would say funny action. Look at look at sideways. The screenplay for sideways. Mm -hmm. Those guys manage to make uh, their action descriptions somehow funny, you know, without being annoying. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's it's a it's a delicate thing to do. I mean, it's uh, you know, I would say if you're, if you're not really confident with it, then give it a little while before you try doing it. But yeah, take a look at what they do. It's really good. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? It's, uh, uh, the scripts that you read every day, is there like a filtration process of getting that? Or is it like some outside you want to have to send it out? Yeah, so, uh, so how, how, how do scripts come to you all? Through agents? Through, uh, I get everything through Gary. I get everything through Gary Allen. Gary Allen tends to get everything through agents, through the agencies, which is astounding because half of them are such direct. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so literally, go back to what I said. If you can write a script that doesn't have typos, you're one leg up on everybody else. <laughs> so <laughs> down to an agent. Um, you never know what will happen. Um, but yeah, I get everything through my boss. Um, and he gets it mostly through agencies and, and personal contacts. Um, you know, Move on. <laughs> um, agencies, management companies, or directly from directors or writer or friends of our companies, uh, or even financiers who are looking for additional financing. Uh, so yeah, we get uh, from different kinds of people. Elizabeth, how do scripts end up in your office? Most of them I get through the executors. And they get them from agents, and they get them from managers, right? And they get them from people they know or are working with or are, you know, have deals with. Um, but occasionally, you know, one will sneak in there that, you know, oh, my neighbor gave me this, you know, <laughs> and, uh, or, you know, this is my my sister in law's friend's niece, or, you know, <laughs> I get a few of those too, so. Um, but I'm always. <laughs> 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 <laugh
Yeah, I agree. I, 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 occasionally you'll, you'll get the you know, friend of a friend's brother's nephew wrote something, read this, and it's terrible. But um, that's funny. I mean, we're, we're not really the first gatekeeper in the industry. It's really the managers and the agents, because you have to first convince a manager or an agent that you have talent and that they want to represent you. Um, because a lot of times companies won't accept uh, unsolicited material, um, or they make you sign a, a release a release form um, because they're afraid of legal repercussions. So, yeah, I think we have. Okay, two more, two more. One over here, and then one over here, and then we'll wrap up. Yes, this is just uh, specifically for notice that I saw on the file that you might have experience with this. But like, do you also get television submissions? Um, I saw the Dutch company that you worked for, the, the two guys. Yeah, well, right now I'm currently working for uh, a television writer. Um, when I was at Paramount, they weren't. It was just film. Uh, it was they would get novels and scripts, but. Um, yeah, so right now I'm sort of uh, I'm in a little different stage of, of what I'm doing, but... Um, Do you receive spec scripts for any of the television shows? Or? Um, I, I haven't. I guess the, the company that I work for now is not really in a development capacity. They're more... Um, uh, they foster projects that are already in development at the moment, but... Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I read my boss's stuff and, and give him notes, and I've actually had to learn a lot about TV writing and things different from, uh, from features, but yeah, I would say TV writing is very exciting right now, so if you're, if you're thinking about that, definitely consider, consider that too, but it's a whole other thing. So. All right, one last question. Okay. Um, obviously, other than making fast and follow you guys, um, what is the... Because you just like kind of brushed over some of the management and like agents. What's the best way? Because I, I don't know where to start. So to get stuff read, be good. I, <laughs> um, I know it's not. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But know your craft. You know, I'm assuming that you're sitting in this room. You probably know your craft. Rock and roll. I mean, I think the next thing to do is to you have to pound the pavement. And by pounding the pavement, I mean mail submissions out. You have to find the boutique agency that, and you have to be lucky. You have to hit that person who has an opening and is interested in new talent and isn't jaded and doesn't want to, you know, is, and has a reader that likes you as well, that's the next thing. One of us has to, somebody, or sorry, more like one of me, um, <laughs> say, well, one of me has to like, like your stuff and pass it up the chain. And it sounds ridiculous, it's just, it's the old fashioned, it's really a Puritan old fashioned nose of the grindstone. And my favorite thing is Stephen King's on writing, man. Nail that, nail that nail in your wall and every rejection you get, slap it on there. Just keep it as motivation, you know, every rejection goes on that nail. Um, and you're just going to get a whole bunch of them and just get used to it. And that's cool because it keep pounding away. Somebody will, somebody will find you. You just have to have that faith in yourself. I think and, the, the, the agent's issue is a whole other panel, but any quick, <laughs> yeah. uh, any quick agent advice, I mean, that, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. Do your research on the agency too. Yeah. You know, don't don't waste time sending stuff if you're really new to CAA. You know, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, they're just not. You know. I got. I'm not represented there. No. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would just say. I mean, think about contests. That's that's one way in because a lot of times agents and editors look at the winners of contests. Um, I would think uh, sending cold queries can be can be a time consuming, it can be tough because a lot of times those get you know, thrown out or, you know. Um, so I would say probably the best way to go is, is through a referral. And I mean, you're here, there are writers. Make friends with writers who have, who have representation and if they read something, you know, that they think is good, um, they'll, you know, likely pass it on. But they have to be at a stage where they're comfortable enough to do that and the writing has to be really good for them to stick their neck out because they're putting their reputation on the line as well as yours. Know when you're ready too. You have to think. Don't just bang something out and send it around. I mean, that's the thing. I think the whole referral thing is, 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 sort of, is sort of yeah. definitely key. I mean, yeah. it's, it's definitely who you know and it's networking and it's actually being out in the world. You know, we, we think of, of writing as a very solitary act, but if you want to get into the business side of writing, it's, it's got kind of, you know, kind of being out there. Being out in the world, um, the my my film agent, I, I my film manager, I, I landed by just existing. You know, I have this blog that that I've built up over time, and that's how my my manager found me. And it was just kind of like being out there, 
um, and just continuing to do what you do very, very well um, for a period of time. Where, and eventually, you know, you, you, if, you're, if you're really good, you're eventually going to get noticed because there are so many bad scripts, as we've, we've heard, that I think that the cream eventually rises to the top, eventually, um, uh, if you hang in there. Well, another thing that I'm actually supposed to even mention is intern. Because, yeah. You know, I know it's sometimes it's really frustrating to work for free, and you know, all of us can afford it, but um, it's invaluable uh, getting in those production companies and meeting those people and networking with them because you will meet people who, even even the lowest echelon there, even the guys in the middle of they're going to move up. And if you befriend them you know, when they're on the lower end of the scale, they'll remember you when they're up there and you'll have somebody to send your script to. So no one is too insignificant. It's true. The industry is very uh, relationship-based industry. So uh, another way to do it is a film festival, participating. So that's one of the ways you can do it. And yeah, make friends for agents or producers who work their room. Asian training because you guys are going to move up the ladder together. Great, so we have, we have room for about another half hour, so uh, we've got sort of uh, uh, things to eat and nibble on, and you can chat with us informally, and that'd be great. Christopher, Juwan, Elizabeth, and Noah, thank you very much.